We were speaking on the subject and learning and studying through the Bible, through this topic, denominations and church names rightly divided. Denominations and church names rightly divided. There, it can get very confusing about, well, who has the right name and, and what denomination are you in? There's no doubt that there are two, basically, uh, two reasons why there are so many different churches not only in America, but also throughout the world. Uh, people name churches all kinds of names, and that is fine. We have learned that and studied that. Uh, but the point is, is that you find two things, and that is, number one, churches hold to differences because of their deeds. In other words, the way they do things. We've talked about it. It's their structure, the way that they're comfortable doing things. Some churches do the Lord's Supper every week. Some don't. We don't do it every week. Some churches do it every week. Some churches, and um, I'm not sure of all the terminology because I didn't grow up in those churches. Some churches have a reading every week. Uh, 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 they have a reading and, 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 and someone gets up and they do a reading, I think is what it's called. And they do the reading every week and then there's certain songs they do with that reading and then... There's someone who reads the scriptures, and then uh, the people repeat some stuff, and then, and then the guy, uh, somebody gets up and gives a message of some sort, and typically the service is that way every week. Uh, typically every week with us, we sing some songs, there's fellowship time, we greet our guests, and then there's preaching, there's an, an invitation, and then there's possibly a closing song. Basically, you know what we do? We have a church tradition. We do things and set things up the way that we want to. i got to be honest with you. There's no, nothing in Scripture that says we have to sing before the message. Did you know that? Uh, typically, even in Scripture, if you really look at it and study it out, through the nation of Israel, they didn't do any singing until their hearts got right with God and there was repentance and then they did worship. Uh, there was really not a worship before uh, repentance. After repentance and humbleness became a strong sense of worship. And so I just want you to know that even the way that we do things here at Freedom is because we like the way that we do them. And there's certain things that we do are simply deeds. In other words, we simply do them because it's the way that we like doing it. But then there's also, which is more important... Churches hold to differences in their doctrine. And that is really what matters. That's really the only thing that matters in all of eternity. And that is what a church believes and teaches. Now I've got to be honest with you. I don't care what color you paint a church. I don't care if the church, some of you may disagree because some of you may be sensitive about it. I don't care if the church has a steeple or not a steeple. I've seen where churches have a steeple and when a hurricane comes knock it off, guess what? They don't put one back. Want to know why? Because it's expensive to put one on the roof. And, and so they did it because of financial reason. You know, there's nowhere in Scripture where you've got to have a steeple. Now, it does signify something, and it, I do believe it symbolizes, and I do believe it can be an identification mark, but you know, there's nothing ungodly about not having a steeple. But I want you to know it is godly and it is important to Christ what is taught within the walls of that maybe funky colored building. It doesn't matter if you have a tin roof. You know not all churches have a tin roof like we do. Some churches have a shingle roof. Some churches have a flat roof. Some churches look like a Hershey's Kiss. If you go towards Roanoke, on the way out to Roanoke, there's a church out there and I, something fellowship. I don't even know the name of it, but I do know what's near it. Right on the corner is a Dairy Queen. My kids like to stop at Dairy Queen. All I know is there's a good sized church. And if you look at the church, it, if you look at the front of it, it looks like it's a Hershey's Kiss sitting there. That's kind of the shape of the building. You know, God doesn't care about the shape of your building. None of that matters. I thank God that their building you know, it looks like that. I hope it's, I want to go in there and actually look at it. It looks awesome. I'd like to see what the inside looks like and, uh, and how they decorate it and all. Because uh, I, I love that. There are some churches that have uh, 
innate uh, woodworking all in their church and there's wood beams and there's it's oval and there's even crosses kind of shaping in the wood beams across the ceiling and it's very beautiful and there's uh, wood uh, paneling all across the walls and there's wood floors and there's wood stages and there's just a lot of wood and if you go over in England you still see a lot of that old style church and you know what I love it it smells great in there but there's nothing godly about those things that's what someone wanted what's most important is what comes out from the pulpit of that church see doctrine matters and I've said all that is because it has to have clarification and we have to go to God's word about what does God say about church names and denominations number one just by way of reminder religious names and labels are used to identify a group Religious names and labels are to identify a group. If I was to toss out the name Pentecostals, you, you would know what that meant. If I was to say the word Lutheran or Calvinist or Seventh-day Adventist or Roman Catholic or even Baptist, you would know exactly what that means. Because it is a label that has been given to it. The labels were in the Bible and labels were given and, and labels were given to John the Baptist. Uh, labels were given to the Apostle Paul. And so I just want you to know that very clearly that the Bible speaks of this. But the labels are only used to identify certain groups. But not only that, religious names and labels, I want you to remember, are man-made. When we talk about church denominations and Bible church names... You keep this in your mind, folks. No one has the corner market on this. A Baptist don't. No one else does. The fact is they are man-made. The reason we are what we are is because somebody named it that in 1992. And there is no record of Paul ever naming his churches by a denominational name. Thirdly, Religious names and labels can cause unnecessary offense and confusion, though. And we've dealt with that in a great way. Do you remember that uh, when we talk about denominations, the word denominate simply means to give a name to? And there's no doubt about it, even though Paul knew that they should be following him doctrinally. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Because there were people in the Corinth church that said, well, I am of Apollos. Do you remember that? And some said, well, I am of Cephas, who was Peter. And some said, well, I am of Paul. And then there were others that said, well, I am of Christ. Well, to be honest with you, there's only one that got it right. And that was the ones who said, I am of Christ. And Paul said, look, let's just get all the matter straight. And that is, if you're going to follow me, follow me because I follow Christ. But if I don't follow Christ, hit the road. And, and you should make sure that you only follow a person because that person is following Christ. But understand that we don't follow man. We follow Jesus Christ. And we're not trying to make a name for ourselves. We're trying to lift high the name of Jesus Christ because it's only at the name of Jesus Christ whereby men and women can be saved and we know that when people start to denominate themselves and people start to exalt their own names people will take man-made names and cherish them as though they are the Word of God and I gotta be honest with you that's sad and it doesn't please the Lord when we do that I pray and hope sincerely that for our church, that when people look at Freedom Baptist Church, I hope that they think of us in this way, and it'll come up on the screen, that Freedom is a church that loves Jesus, teaches the Bible, and loves people. Now, I said this last week, but here's the thing. You can sum up every bit of our core mission, our core purpose. You, you can sum everything clever that we come up with and cliches, all of that. All of it is encompassed and wrapped up and bottled in this statement right here. If this isn't what we are and who we are, I've got to be honest with you, we're not doing it God's way. And every now and then you have to take this and you have to realign what you're doing. 
It's kind of like, uh, I, I don't know if any of you like to shoot guns. I don't know if any of you uh, care anything about that. But I, I can be honest with you. You can have a perfectly straight barrel. You can have the best ammunition that is out there to be bought. But if you don't line the sights up correctly, if you don't put the scope on that rifle or that gun correctly, if you are not looking at the target correctly, if it's out of line, you will not hit the target. You will miss it. I don't care how big the gun is. I don't care how powerful the gun is. I don't care what kind of ammo you put in the gun. If you are not aiming at the right thing, aligning it up with the mission, the core purpose, and what this is for our life if we don't line it up with those things we will not hit the target spiritually we will miss it every time and then we'll look at it and wonder what happened I'll tell you what happened we weren't loving Jesus like we ought to we weren't teaching the Bible like we ought to and we certainly weren't loving the people like we ought to because you can't love people like God loves them unless you love God like you ought to love him if you don't teach the Bible and allow it to be taught in you and you readily receive God's word you won't do any of those things and so it's important to us, and it should be important to you, that we've got to be mindful that it's not about our name. And by way of review, let me just remind you, religious names and labels are used to identify groups. Religious names and labels are man-made. And religious names and labels can cause unnecessary offense and confusion. But now I want you to look at this. On the screen, religious names and labels are not to be loved and cherished. Religious names and labels are not to be loved and cherished. I want you to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 9, and we'll get there in just a second. John chapter 9, the Gospel of John, John chapter 9. I've said this before in the series, you and I should never be married to or give our allegiance to any religious name. I am married to one physically, and that is to a Melissa Galden. That was her name before she married me, Melissa Galden. And I am married to one. I don't give my allegiance to another. I don't go looking for another. I don't allow them to entertain me. The fact is, I give my allegiance and my life and my marriage to her because that is who I am married to. And I want you to know that our allegiance spiritually must be to Jesus Christ and to His Word, period. And when you cheat on God... You are committing spiritual adultery. You are committing idolatry. When you put anything before your God, when you step out of the Bible and His principles and His Scripture, and you decide to live it your way instead of God's way, as a born-again believer, you, my friend, are committing spiritual adultery. And God takes that serious. Say, what do you mean? The Bible says that when we become saved, we are made one with Christ. I have been made in a union. I have come in union with Jesus Christ. And He and I are one. And to do anything that's outside of this book and outside the things that are Spirit-led is absolutely sin. And that's why our allegiance must be to Jesus Christ. I said this before. I hear people say this, you know, even within our realm. I was born a Baptist, I was raised a Baptist, I married a Baptist, I've always been a Baptist, and when I die, I'll die a Baptist. And i got to be honest with you, I, I believe that that produces nothing but spiritual immaturity to say that. I, I, I don't even know what that means. Why? What, what, what point does that even make to say that? We have put our allegiance into a man-made system instead of Jesus Christ. When I die, 
I have given specific instructions to my wife. Do not exalt the church. Do not exalt the denomination of whatever that may be or that someone may get hyped up about. You make sure only Christ is known and Christ is preached. Don't you exalt what I was or who I was or what I did. You make sure Christ is known and that will be about 15 minutes. And you preach Him. And then you preach repentance and give an imitation. Why? That's all that matters. That's all that will matter. And the point is, is when people search for a local church to worship, the issue is not the name on the sign out the front. The issue is what does the church teach? What do they teach doctrinally? People ask, oh, what kind of music do you have? Probably none you're going to like. Say, why do you say that? Because if you're already asking that question, you already have the premises, you already have the pretense of I've already and will come based on the music that I like. We'll probably disappoint you somewhere along the line if that's the case. Because we may not always sing the songs you like. We may not sing all the old ones. We may not sing a new one you like that's being played on Spirit FM. I, I don't know. We can't make you happy on that. That's not our point. That's not our desire. That's not our goal. That's not why we exist here. We are here to love Jesus, to teach the Bible, and love people. That's why we are here. And so it's so important that we get it straight. we got to make sure that we're teaching God's Word rightly divided. And in John chapter 9, would you look at that verse 28 and 29? I bet you remember this. John 9, 28 and 29. Notice, the Bible says here, the Bible says, And it came to pass about eight days after these things, he took Peter and John and went up to the mountain to pray. And as he prayed, this is John chapter 9. I'm in Luke chapter 9. That will not help you at all. Luke is not where we should be. That's a good one, but that's not where we should be. Look at verse 28 and 29. One more time. Let's go at it again. Notice what happened. Then they reviled him. They reviled Jesus and said, Thou art his disciples, but we are Moses' disciples. In other words, Jesus has done something incredible. He has helped people. He is, as the Jews required, signs and wonders. And Jesus has done that. To prove to them who he was. And the religious nutcases of the day got involved and started rebuking the Savior. The Bible says, then they reviled him and said, You know what? Thou art his disciple. All you guys that are hanging out with this dude, that's fine, but I want you to know who we are. We are in a different camp than you. Verse 28, 29, excuse me. We know that God spake unto Moses, but as for this fellow, talking about Jesus, we know not from whence he is. There's no doubt about it that these people loved and cherished who they were denominationally. They loved who they were connected to and with. Hey, you ever been around people that they just couldn't wait to start name dropping? People love to name drop. Well, I do you know so and so? Well, I know so and so. Well, I know the King of Kings. What about that one? If you don't know that one, it doesn't matter who you know. You better get that one down. You better get that one straight. But people love to name drop. We love to get so everything out of focus and we miss the target. And the most carnal church in the New Testament, the Corinthian church, loved and cherished names and labels. People named their church the Corinthian church. Did you know that in America? <laughs> they named their church. That's not a good name. I mean, if you're going to pick one, I wouldn't pick that one. The Bible doesn't say not to pick it, but they were rebuked in Scripture often. Growing up, you, you go to John chapter 7 and just hang out there for a moment. John chapter 7. We're going to be in the book of John a little bit tonight. Not Luke, John. All right, don't go to Luke. I may read from Luke, but 
I'll correct it, all right? I grew up in a Baptist church. At least it was for a long time. And then they dropped the name Baptist. And then later they became, they joined a Baptist association. Conservatives of Virginia, I think. I'm not real sure. I, I don't know. But then I, went to a then I went to a Baptist college. And, and the pastor that started that church, he's dead now, but he leaned towards a big Baptist brighter mentality. He, he, they were big into the Baptist thing. Big, big into the Baptist. You had to be Baptist. And it, you couldn't join their church even though you were, if you were baptized already. See, some, sometimes churches teach that in order to join their church, you've got to be saved and baptized. And if you're not baptized in their church, you can be baptized in their membership. And, and so, uh, this, is, this was the case as well with them. And, and even though you might have been baptized, if, if it wasn't recognized in their fellowship, you had to get, which there's no such word for it, rebaptized. You know, there's no word for rebaptized. It'd be, there's no word for resalvation. There's no such thing. And so, it can get awfully confusing. And so I, I'm sure not wanting to cast judgment. I just want to tell you a little bit about my background. There are some who believed in the Baptist camp that there would be a part, that they would be a part of the marriage supper. You, you know the marriage supper uh, of the Lamb and, and uh, in the Bible, and the Bible speaks of that and teaches of that. They believe that they would be the, the part of the marriage supper of the Lamb and that everyone else that came would be as guests. So in other words, it would only be Baptists who sat at the table. Now I've got to be honest with you, I'm not the smartest or, or, or the sharpest knife in the drawer, and I get that. I, I don't have a problem admitting that. But there are some things that at age 27 to 29 that man became really confusing to me. And I couldn't wrap my head and mind around some things that um, were just difficult to absorb. And everyone else was fine with it because that's all that they had known. But I felt that it would... That it was isolating a lot of people and compartmentalizing groups and cliques. And I would hear many Baptists say this, you know what I'd be if I wasn't Baptist? I'd be ashamed. <laughs> And I don't even know what that means. And, and listen, listen to me very carefully because cause you're going to go out there and misquote me and misinterpret what I said. And if you are listening, watching this, don't email me and write me and give me a bunch of grief. Because I'm just going to send you my transcript, then you can read it for yourself. I'm not against those who believe like that. I'm not against you. I'm not against you. I am not against you. I don't want to pick a fight with you. I don't have any agenda. I don't have any agenda with making people be isolated. But I'm also not trying to develop my own camp. I'm just saying, from my own experience, so I'm speaking from my experience. Whose experience am I speaking from? Okay, I'm not speaking from yours. I'm just saying that I have never bought into any of this stuff from day one. That doesn't make me special or illegitimate. I don't know. But as I have studied the Scriptures and grown more in Christ, and studied His Word, the more it just seems to become more of an irritant when Christians start to divide Christians 
into their camps, their circles, their cliques. And then they judge and refuse anyone to participate if they aren't just like them. In this community, it is hard to be welcomed in anyone's camp. Because everyone has their own agenda. Can't get people to fellowship together and come together. Because if you do, then they're going to try to run you up the flagpole and try to push their ideology on you. And oftentimes when they do that, they want you to come together because they're either wanting you to give monetarily to something that they're doing. I just want to know, why can't the people come together to preach the Word of God to the people of God and worship God? How come we can't just do that? How come we got to come and start splitting up the flock? And when you don't, just sign on to their dotted line and sign in into their... Their, their doctrine and their way of systems. Man, they will write you off. You try to invite someone to be a part of an event that we do. It's like swimming in peanut butter. You just don't get anywhere. You won't. And I just believe it seems to be a little bit hypocritical. And seems to be the opposite of what we should be desiring to accomplish. But that seems to be the end result when we love and cherish our name. And I want you to look at John chapter 7. And I want you to look at verses 44 through 52. And you judge for yourself if this is any validity to what I'm saying. I, I'm not here to make you believe like the pastor. I'm just wanting to present biblical truth to you based on a very sensitive subject that is rampant through your community. Where you live. And I've been here long enough to figure it out. So, I'm just not the new kid on the block anymore. I believe that I can say that uh, I'm one of you ones. Look at verse 44. The Bible says, And some of them would have taken him, but no man laid hands on him. Then came the officers of the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said unto them, Why have you not brought him? The officers answered, Never man spake like this man. Then answered them, the Pharisees, Are you also deceived? Don't you know what he's saying and what he's doing? Verse 48, Well, have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed on him? But this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. Nicodemus saith unto them, he that came to Jesus by night, being one of them, doth our law judge any man before it hear him, and knoweth what he doeth? Look at verse 52. Then answered and said unto him, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. May I say to you what the Pharisees were doing here in this very important passage of Scriptures. The Pharisees saw themselves as the only one who had the market on handling the Scriptures. They believed that they were the sole authority, the sole proclaimer and protector of the truth. In other words, if you don't believe just like them 
or do what they say, then they use tactics such as uh, intimidation. They use tactics like slander and guilt and fear to keep their members in line and the same tactics to attack others. Folks, may I say to you, that is a definition of a cult. This is very cultic here. And this is a clear-cut case of intimidation. And I want you to know that we need to be sure that we define the lines of biblical authority and intimidation. Some people think just because you stand up for the Bible that you are intimidator. No, we're not a tolerator of your uh, habitual sinful choices. So you're right. We're not tolerant of that. But we're also not going to lord over you and walk around and hammer you and follow after you and shun you to the point that you won't come to repentance. We don't find that there's any fruitfulness in going around and talking about you behind your back in order to bring you back to the fold. We don't believe that's biblical. We believe what's biblical is presenting the gospel truth to you and then letting the truth of the gospel change you. And if the Spirit of God doesn't change you, no church is going to do it. And that's why it's important for us to make sure that we don't become like a Pharisee. We don't own the market here. We didn't come here to straighten people out. God has only brought me here to be the pastor of one church. And for the meantime, that's Freedom Baptist Church. I don't have time to go around and figure out what every Tom, Dick, and Harry is doing in another church, what they're saying, what they're wanting to do, what they don't do, how they do it, how they don't do it, what they sing, what they pray. I don't care. What I do care is about the flock that God has me to shepherd here. That's all I care about. And would to God that the churches in our area and across America get serious about what God has called them to do. And God will straighten out all the ones who don't do what God's called them to do. God is the judge. He's the ultimate judge. Won't you stop loving and cherishing your little camp and start doing what the Bible says do. And here in John chapter 12, if you'd look at that, Look at two verses. This is really incredible. John chapter 12, verses 42 and 43. And, and notice this passage here. It says, 42 and 43, Nevertheless, among the chief rulers, also many believed on Him. But because of the Pharisees, well, here they are again, those stinking Pharisees, my soul, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. Uh-oh, somebody's not going to be happy if I leave the camp. Uh-oh. I'm going to deny the denomination. and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deny the name. And I'm just going to be a fall of Christ. And they were fearful. People were going to shun them. What in the world has happened to the church? That's the thought process. Well, they'll just shun you. God forbid that the church shuns you. May they welcome you. And may you find forgiveness and repentance there. Notice this verse 43, because here's the kicker. For they love the praise of what? Come on, they love the praise of what? Yeah. More than the praise of God. May we never bow down or give our allegiance to any certain camp, any name, or denominational label. But may we at Freedom be totally committed to and faithful with our allegiance to the person and work of Jesus Christ.
here at Freedom, it is my heart in spite of what tactics other may use or the words they say. That our church would never reject or shun a person based on their name or label. But based on their stand, now listen to me, but based on their stand and position of truth of God's Word. We will not tolerate here people who do not believe in the truth of this gospel and listen to me and don't live it out. I'm not talking about what name you carry, what uh, denomination you grew up in. I'm not talking about what kind of experience you had, good or bad. The fact is, do you believe in the truth of God's Word? And will you live it? And if you don't live it, then the Bible uses something called church discipline. We will not have fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. That is biblical separation. And the church belongs to Jesus Christ. It is His bride. And His bride ought to act like they're married to one. And His name is Christ. Here is the point I want to reiterate. We looked at the Corinth church and the Pharisees. The Pharisees and the carnal Corinthians. In the Bible, they love their names and they love their labels. They love that. And I believe that it's a wonderful, liberating day when we decide to quit loving our labels and our names. And we simply fall in love with Jesus and His Word with all of our hearts. Man, why can't we just love Jesus and His Bible? Why we got to play all the political games? Why we got to chase one another? Why do I need to know and be kept up with on who's doing what, on what social media? Why do I care what the naysayers say. And why should you care? What you should care about is what does Jesus say? And if you love God and if you love His Word, then just stay focused on that. Let us be a church that loves Jesus and loves His Bible and loves other people. Let's be that church. Don't worry about what name's in the marquee. The marquee may fall over. A tornado may come and wipe it off. A tornado may come and rip the roof right off the building. That doesn't make us who we are. We are the bride of Christ. And may we act and live like that. Religious names and labels are used to identify certain groups. Religious names and labels are man-made. Religious names and labels can cause unnecessary offense and confusion. And religious names and labels are not to be loved and cherished. And lastly, let me give you one more thought. Religious names and labels should distinguish, but not hinder the church's mission. I really want you to listen to that. And I really want that to get into your heart. Religious names and labels should distinguish. I've already said before, I'm not against names and labels. But if it's going to hinder the church's mission, then I'm not for it. There's nothing wrong with a name necessarily. But if that name hinders others or causes confusion, we've spent a lot of time on this in previous studies, or it hurts the church's goals, it hurts the church's purpose, it hurts the church's mission, then may I say to you, there is a problem somewhere can you imagine for a moment if all the churches around here can you imagine if they didn't have any name would that can would that make sense or would it be confusing hello it's 20 degrees hotter up here than it is out there all right hang with me if all the churches in this community did not have a name at all. Would that be, would that help or would it be confusing? Okay. What if all the churches in our area had the same name? 
Would that help or be confusing? That would definitely be confusing. So I want to say again and reiterate, there's nothing exclusively evil about a name. After all, how in the world would you be able to tell Ben and Jerry's ice cream from Briar's ice cream? Say, well, brother, you just need to taste it. Well, I get it. But before you can taste it, you can look on the label and be able to distinguish it. And if we are honest with ourselves, in our circle of Baptists, there have been many times where that has been a hindrance in bringing others to church. That is why I personally often tell people that we are a Bible church because that is clear and a better definition of who we are and what we do. Without putting, without people automatically putting us into a group. Because if you say all the words, people are automatically going to put you in a group. Whether they've had a good experience or a bad experience, you just got grouped. There have been times where I have been engaging people in a conversation, maybe you've been there, about church. And before I even get started, I get asked the question, what's the name of the church? And as soon as I slap the word Baptist in it, the conversation is over, they give me the cold shoulder, and they act like they never had any interest in talking with me. Now folks, I didn't do anything to ruin the Baptist name. Like I said, I don't have a dog in the fight. I'm just saying to you that people automatically have a preconceived idea of what they think it should be or is. And as soon as you start a conversation, man, they end it when you put that in there. And folks, I want to be clear. I'm not against Baptist. Did you hear me now? So if you heard nothing else, hear that statement. I'm not against Baptist. Nor do I have desire to change our name. That isn't the purpose of the series, nor is it to gang up on others or isolate them. After all, we do have Baptists in our name. It's on our documents, and it's on our inco incorporation papers, and our charter papers. If anything through this that I want you to gravitate and understand is this, may we never let ourselves become so isolated that we cannot help people find the truth that is in God's Word about this sensitive topic that may exist among many Christians, churches, and even mostly in the unsaved community. And I think we've got to be honest with ourselves. People do have preconceived ideas and thoughts about who we are. Even though they've never been here, spoken to us, but all because of our name. I want you to go with me to one last verse before I close. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I want you to look at verses 3 through 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I want you to notice this as I close. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 through 6. You catch up. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. In whom the God of this world, little g, O D, of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commandeth the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts. To give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. There is an intense battle going on right now, folks. And that is the battle for the souls of men. People are perishing and going to hell. There is a war being waged for all eternity. 
And it is for the souls of every person. Satan is trying to blind people from the truth of God's Word. The Bible said here in 2 Corinthians verse 4 of chapter 4 that the God of this world, that is Satan. Satan is trying to blind people. He's trying to keep them in darkness. And he's trying to make them delusional about the truth of Jesus Christ. One of the greatest tools that I believe that Satan uses is organized religion. Religion is about keeping a list, keeping the traditions of the church, their rules, their practices, their deeds, their ordinance, and not after Christ. Our mission, our church, is to infiltrate the darkness with the mighty and glorious light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Your desire and my desire ought to be to reach the lost and to grow the saved. That ought to be our heart. Our heart is to raise fully faithful, committed followers of Jesus Christ. Fully faithful, committed followers of Jesus Christ. However, you cannot do that while you are focused on your label, your name, your deed, and your preferences. We must be focused on being a Bible church that is rooted in the solid foundation of the Scriptures. And that is why you hear me often say, I say it a lot, but I don't say it enough, I ought to say it more. You cannot live what you haven't learned. And here at Freedom Baptist Church, we want to be a place that is known and is uh, uh, validated by a place where we learn the Bible to live the Bible. That is what we are. That is what we ought to strive to be. A place to learn the Bible, to live the Bible. You cannot live what you don't learn. And may that define freedom and not some other man-made label or identity that is forced upon us. We are all about learning from God and His Word. And I don't want to put up walls. And I don't want to receive walls that others may put up that may hinder us from our mission. If people want to argue and fight over this issue, you're going to have to do it without me. Why? Because we're going to be too busy striving to continue to exalt Christ, preach His Word and His Gospel. So you're going to need to make an appointment. We don't ever want to get muddy and we don't surely want, certainly want to muddy the water with issues that will only confuse people. And I want you to know that all the jargon and stuff that goes on, it does nothing but confuse people and hurts Christians in the process. I would like for us to always be a church that isn't exclusive. We're not a church that is an elite church. But we ought to be a church that is inclusive of all people. Not become a church that, known, that is known for its label, but a church that is known for being a church for others. A place to learn the Bible and live the Bible, but a place where we're simply a church for others. A place that loves God, loves and teaches His Word, and then loves people. If you've got to have your label, by all means have it. But as the old songs say, I'd rather have Jesus than all the world's fame. You can have your silver and gold. You, 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 you can have all those names. I'd just rather have Jesus. This is what will matter. This is the only thing that has ever mattered. And may we be a people... A church that learns this so we can go out there and live it. I don't have any doubt you can do it here. I don't have any doubt you can pass it here. You can pass the test here. But I'm talking about on your workplace. I'm talking about at your home. I'm talking about on the ball field. I'm talking about in your closet, out of the closet, on your Facebook, out of your Facebook. 
I'm talking about wherever you go, that there is no doubt who you follow. You're not following a church man-made system. You're going to follow Jesus Christ, a committed, faithful follower of no one else but Jesus. May we pray. Father, we thank you for tonight. And God, I pray that we will always be that church. We don't get hung up about names and all those things and, and the labels and things that people try to stick on us. May we just be a church that is for others. May you be exalted and may we love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Ushers, would you come?